just as unfavourable as the food were the winds. We, we basically got a bit of a problem. Our, our winds are driving us northeast. The optimum route is not directly south or north. We've got to go west of Greenland to, to take advantage of the catabatic winds. And uh, so this is what we're uh, having this little bit of a dilemma, a bit of a strategic think about. The catabatic winds start on the elevated ice sheets in Greenland. The build-up of high-density cold air over the ice sheets brings into play enormous gravitational energy and so creating the perfect winds for the team to reach their goal. That is, if you can find them. The team had no choice but to trek, every kilometre increasing their chances of picking up the catabatic winds. Hayes and McDermid were both experienced haulers, though the new mode of transport was not suiting kite expert Crow. Yeah, it's sure a lot slower than kiting, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Two nautical an hour versus 20 nautical an hour. What do you prefer? <laughs> I think I like kiting. <laughs> I think if I had to walk 2,000 kilometers, I think I'd use those poles to poke up my eyes. The pain continued for six more days. Though they had completed 2,300 kilometers, they still had 1,600 to go. Walking the distance was not an option. Okay, after six days uh, standing, that, well six uh, of the last seven days standing with nothing. We've now had the, the sign, we've got the weather, it's all changed, it's coming from the west, it's snowy, it's blowy. Uh, we've got a weather front that's come up, we're on the northern edge and uh, this thing is moving quite fast and uh, our meteorological advisors told us we've got to keep ahead of it if we want to keep our winds. So it's quite imperative that we actually get moving this morning, we get going and we really give a full day. I mean, we're just gonna go as long as it takes. For the next week, the team pushed their already aching limbs and broke record after record in the daily distances they covered. As we approached the top of Greenland, we had some horrendous wind. We were screaming along. I mean, holding on for grim life just to harness this wind while we could to get the distance we needed. When we finally saw the mountains of northern Greenland peering out of the storms, I mean, it just sort of blew us away. We, we'd seen nothing but flat ice cap for, what, I think 45 days, and then suddenly the, this, this beautiful terrain sort of looms up out of the, out the clouds in this horrendous wind and storm. Uh, yeah, it was a very special moment. We had to pull our sleds out a good, I think, 24 hours uh, across some pretty dodgy terrain with crevasses and melting water to set up a camp on top of the glacier at J.P. Cox Fjord. Norwegians Run Gelnes and Tori Larsen were the only other people to have ventured into J.P. Cox Fjord 12 years earlier. The unspoilt nature of the landscape, truly spellbinding. I think all of us, um, when we left our tent and got to the edge of the grass and looking down the fjord, we, we just went, you know, wow. I mean, this place, firstly, we were perhaps the third or fourth people in history of mankind to see it. 
It was so pristine, so still, so unspoiled uh, and so pure. White than white ice, blue skies, untouched mountains. We were all blown away by it. I think it's just a, the biggest example of what the Earth looks like when man hasn't spoiled it. Though Hayes and the team soon saw how man is spoiling it, inadvertently. The idea was then we'd, we'd put our camp there, we'd just go with backpacks and skis just to, to trek down the glacier um, to as far as we could get to the ocean and then come back up. We thought it would be a pretty uh, simple trip, you know, it wasn't far, 15 kilometres from back, but uh, it uh, ended up slightly more uh, dangerous than we, than we planned. We were walking through marshland, just sinking and getting soaked to the skin, and we suddenly thought, is this a good idea to come down here? Having experienced Greenland's environmental problems firsthand, they decided to seek firmer ground at camp. But even there, they were on treacherous terrain. We started the long haul out to get to Karnak in northwest Greenland. Uh, and, and this part, this journey had never been done before, this part of the whole trip. And yeah, we firstly we had to get out of this, this northern Greenland ice cap and there was no wind. We had to walk for days and days and days without any wind. And then we have wind which is hitting us in our face, which, which is, is the one wind you don't want. Right now we're trying to stretch our food out as uh, much as possible because we think we're going to be longer than our 65 days because we've got a high pressure system parked right over the area of Greenland that we're in that's making the winds turn southwest which is pretty much exactly a headwind. So until the wind turns southeast we're going to be uh, taking a long time to get out of here. We need to conserve our food. Enormous problems, and I think after about a week we'd only travelled about 50 kilometres. Given their dwindling food supplies, the team tried in vain to make the most out of the difficult circumstances. Walking to Karnak would take 45 days. Impossible given what food was left. Without a change in the winds, the situation would become desperate. Still got 525 kilometers to go, and our food in theory goes to day 65, so we're, uh, we're cutting back on food, rationing, cutting three dinners for each of us into uh, two dinners to make three, putting butter in our food, and trying to make it last and going a little bit hungry as well. <laughs> <laughs> 